I was really excited to talk about this when I first found it, but it's now gonna be like a mainstream thing. It's gonna be probably going into productions, indie productions, and you're gonna have more cinematic experiences. It was, it was cool, it was cool. In this episode, we're looking at two Nikkor lenses that are now released. They were, we mentioned them in the first episode actually, but they are now released and the reviews are in. We have another Synology NAS, yes, another one. Um, some Sennheiser Netflix crossover news, a new Avid Media Composer feature release, and a new DaVinci Resolve release. So, let's get stuck in. Hello and welcome to the third episode of DigiPro News, a topical podcast that looks to round up the latest and greatest news in the world of digital video production. This could be anything from tech, hardware, software, you name it, whatever it is that helps you as creators, digital video creators, to get ahead of the competition. As you well know, DigiPro Tips is all about working smarter, not harder, which gives you time to be more creative. And so DigiPro News is an extension to this. I'm going out there finding all of the relevant and greatest newest information possible in the tech world to help you make informed decisions and keep you ahead of the game. Right, let's get straight into these two Nikkor lenses from Nikon that are now available. Well, they're, they're on pre-order right as I'm recording this, but they are now available, they've been released. So as returning listeners of the DigiPro News podcast, tick for you, you will know that in the first episode, I covered the announcement of these two new lenses and they're actually already here. They, we thought, it, didn't know it was gonna take this long, but they're actually already here and the reviews are in. So the first up is the 85 millimeter F 1.2S. Now this is the Z mount lens for the Nikon Z cameras. Um, so it's the Nikkor Z 85 millimeter F 1.2S. It's a fast mid telephoto lens that is in direct competition with the RF Canon, with Canon RF 85 millimeter F 1.2 as well. I mentioned that in the first episode and we'll bang on the money because looking at the first reviews that are in, it is neck and neck. It the the RF and now this Nikon eighty five this Nikkor eighty five millimeter are going to be head you know head to head. I did mention that it would need to be something special to put it up against the RF, and it's done it by all accounts. It's done it. I'm just going here from the reviews um, that I've read online and the videos that I've watched uh, also kind of on YouTube from other creators that have reviewed this lens. Uh, they've had access to the lens before anyone else did really. And looking at the primary features that they stated on their website, the first one that really hits home from what from the reviews that I've seen is that the bokeh, the bokeh, however you want to say it, is beautiful. It's been stated that it's really noticeable and the shallow depth of field that you can get at f1.2 is just phenomenal. Phenomenal. And that is what we're looking for at an f1.2 lens. Obviously, we are looking at this as a portrait lens, like a wedding photographer, a videographer that mainly shoots, you know, talking heads. Um, it's not, you know, it's not a nature, it's not a wildlife kind of landscape lens. But when you're shooting portrait photography, you want that beautiful, blurry, buttery, smooth, round bokeh in the background. That's what you're after, and apparently this is stunning. The multi-focusing system that uses stepping motors, there's two of them in this lens, and as you can see from the video on screen here, it is ridiculously fast at changing focus, meaning the AF is bang on. It is, it is super fast. It is up there with the RF from Canon. Apparently lens aberrations are significantly reduced. And for videographers that are using this lens in very quiet situations, so actually, you know, wedding videographers, for example, where you want during the ceremony to be as silent as possible, that motor on the lens, that can really get in the way sometimes. But apparently this is absolutely silent. Compared against, you know, other um, 85 millimeter lenses, this is, you can't you can't even hear it when you hold it up against the mic. So you won't get any of that background noise in to your footage, which is great. Oh, and apparently it has focus breathing compensation, though I haven't obviously been able to test or really seen any reviews about this, but they do mention it. So what's not to like about this lens so far then? It ticks all the boxes, apparently. Well, I guess it comes down to the price because this lens is $2,800 starting price. Yeah, $2,800, which puts it Actually, it puts it slightly cheaper than the RF from Canon. Um, so, you know, there's that, which is a plus. 
but it's still a lot of money. You know, that, that's not a cheap lens. But if you're in the market for an 85 millimeter, you could just be in with a shot with the Nikkor 85 millimeter. If you're using Nikon Z mounted cameras, that is obviously. So then onto the second release from Nikon, which is the 26 millimeter F2.8 Nikkor pancake lens. And I've looked at the videos of this lens actually being held in hand and it is astonishingly small. Like it's, it's flat. You could, you could mistake it for a camera, you know, sensor cap. It's or a converter, like a lens converter that you just don't have a lens on the front. It's that small. Um, so yeah, the pancake is absolutely the right term to use for this. But apparently it's also really lightweight, which makes it a great travel kit lens as well. Lens pros out there will be happy to know that this 26 millimeter from Nikkor is a metal design body. It's not plastic like some of the others in this focal distance range. It is made out of metal, which, I'll get onto it in a little bit later, but uh, you know, it seems to be bumping the price somewhat. And the first impressions are that it's much sharper than the 28 millimeter. Oh, I say much sharper. It is, it is noticeably sharper, but that doesn't mean it's much sharper. It, it is sharper, shall we say, than the 28 millimeter nickel lens. Um, and you know, 26 is wider. It's you getting more out of your lens. It's a full frame lens. Should have mentioned that at the beginning, which is unusual, you know, at this kind of, wide length pancake kind of lens. It is a full frame lens. So yeah, what are the what are the downsides to it? Well, it has been noted that it doesn't have as many coatings as like the 85 millimeter, they even stated on the, the 85 millimeter, the coatings that it has. Uh, they don't have as many coatings on the 26 millimeter and apparently in the highlights, you can start to see some purple fringing going on. So for kind of street photography and landscape could pose an issue, um, I guess, to some people. I also did find a review that the, Bokeh in the 26 millimeter is like busier than the 28 millimeter, though, I mean, it was it was really hard to kind of see that. It, it's, I say it's personal opinion, but it, yeah, it, it did look a little, I guess busier is the right word, but it just didn't look as nice and smooth, as clean as the 28 millimeter. So in the first episode, I said that this lens probably needs to come in at around about $300 to put it in the same kind of price bracket for lenses in this focal distance uh, range. It's not at $300. It's what, what is it? It's, it's actually $200 dearer than that. It's $500. That's what they're coming out with for this lens. I can't really see why. Um, apart from the fact, you know, it is full frame. It is a metal design. Um, it's sharp. I don't know that that's $200. It's worth an extra $200 for that. Yeah. I mean, you have to make up your own opinion, I guess, but, um, yes, $500 for this lens. Let me know what you think in the comments on YouTube or, um, Apple podcasts and Spotify. If you're listening on there, let me know in the reviews, um, what you think as well. Um, cause that's, you know, a good place to do it and gives me a review for the podcast. Win, win. Okay, let's move on to something that is, I was really excited to talk about this when I first found it. Um, it is a crossover between Sennheiser and Netflix. Now this doesn't really uh, come into digital uh, video production. Like it's not something right now that we'll be able to utilize, but I wanted to talk about it just because it's so cool. So basically wh whether you knew about it or not, Sennheiser have created this technology that takes like a 5.1 or 7.1 mix and manages to put it into a stereo mix. So 5.1, 7.1 for those, it's like a surround mix basically, but they've managed to get it into just two channels, to a stereo mix. And they've called it Ambio. Um, it's been around for a few years now actually, um, but Netflix have adopted it um, because they're calling it spatial audio. That's what Netflix are calling it. And what it does is it allows a user um, it used to be just in headphones that this worked best, but now they're saying any kind of laptop, iPad, TV sets, this is what, what kind of uh, intrigued me about it, with stereo speakers can utilize this spatial audio to get a surround sound cinematic feeling like out of their TV without any kind of sound bar, without any surround sound system using Sennheiser's Ambio technology. Um, I'm just gonna play like the teaser from uh, Netflix here and just, Listen, like if you've got headphones in, great. 
even if you haven't, it should still work. Just have a little listen to this. Right, I'm, hom I'm hoping that worked for you because that, that's what you can now get on Netflix in their premium package though. This is where they get you. It's only for premium users, which you have to pay extra for, obviously, but uh, apparently it's on 700 different titles that they've got and will be on basically everything that comes out from them uh, from now on, pretty much. And yeah, for premium users, it's uh, available right now. You can you can go and try it out. Would love uh, to hear your thoughts on this uh, once you have tried it out. But why I'm excited about this is because it's going to bring spatial audio or... Um, 3D binaural audio is what it used to be called like years ago. Um, and you used to be able to play around there, listen to different YouTube uh, videos with that on it. But it's now going to be like a mainstream thing. It's going to be probably going into productions, indie productions, and you're going to have more cinematic experiences, I feel, and productions, cinematic audio productions that are going to be able to be utilizing technology like this because, you know, Sennheiser won't be able to keep hold of this forever. Um, and it's going to be ena enable spatial 3D, whatever you want to call it, audio on such a range of productions, your production even, which is just going to be class. It's going to be so good to listen um, and view productions like that. So yeah, I'm excited for this. Not wholly what this you know podcast is for, but I just thought I'd let you know because it was, it was cool. It's cool. So as you are well aware by now, if you watch DigiPro Tips channel, if you listen to this podcast, you will have noted that network attached storage is a bit of a thing for DigiPro Tips. And that's why I have another announcement for you on a Synology NAS that has come to market. And it's it's the entry level two bay NAS that would be just fantastic for many, many small, you know, uh, teams, basically like two, maybe up to four even editors, motion designers, however many you've got, um, or even just somebody working from home that wants extra um, storage capacity without having to use loads and loads of hard drives. But basically Synology have released a new uh, NAS. It's called, let me just scroll up here. It's called the DS223. And, you know, going back through their different naming structures, it's a two bay NAS in the 2023 version. There you go, easy, DS223. Um, so yeah, the two bay NAS has been updated with a little bit of a newer style, looks quite cool there. Nothing's really changed, nothing's really changed. It has USB 3.1 ports, um, it does have three of them. It has the same one gigabit ethernet port. Um, it's got a four core 1.7 gigahertz Realtek RTD 1619B CPU in it. All right, great, um, it's not, it's not, massively beefy at all um two gigabit two gigabytes of ram though i always recommend upgrading the ram when you buy a nas just gives you that little bit of extra bandwidth in terms of rewrite operations so yeah nothing remarkable about it what is remarkable or what is better now uh is that they are talking about their hyper backup which allows for a hybrid cloud solutions, which I actually talked about in my uh, remote editing uh, video up there and also um, in my QNAP NAS uh, video there as well, about the ability to use cloud storage with your NAS so that you can, basically, it's a great feature because you can store more in the cloud and the projects that you're actively working on, you only need to keep on your NAS. So you can basically, you never really need to upgrade the amount of storage that you have in your NAS because if you're archiving properly, you just send everything up to your cloud storage and then only have your active projects on your NAS to be able to work from in with that fast connection. Everything else just goes up to the cloud and you have that two-way two -way sync. Brilliant. So if you're using Dropbox, Google Drive, Box, whatever it might be, you can now with Synology, it never really used to work this way before. It wasn't as trustworthy as like Qtier from QNAP, but now Synology, even the two bay NAS has this ability, which is great because it does allow smaller users, smaller creators, video, um, you know, videographer, videographers, motion designers, whoever you might be, to utilize this feature, to store more up there. Though you do, you know, you've got to have a plan with these uh, cloud services, but that's cheaper probably than keeping on, ex, you know, buying ex, um, more and more storage for your NAS or the expansion units, whatever it might be, buying the physical media, you can just now store it up there and have the active projects there. 
easy. And it also allows you to remote edit uh, with your colleagues as well. In fact, this, this could be a great use case for larger teams having one of these smaller units next to each of your editors or designers, in fact, so that they can sync and remote edit on the projects that they need directly from a NAS, um, not having to store on hard drives. They can store more projects and can store bigger projects directly on the NAS and have everything else, all your old years worth of old uh, projects up in the cloud. So yeah, that's what the uh, DS223 is. That's why it's exciting for me, um, just because it now, now enables smaller teams, smaller creators to get involved with network attached storage. And you know, network attached storage at DigiPro Tips, it's all about working smarter, not harder. So dig in. As I mentioned, those links, uh, I'll put links in the show notes uh, for audio listeners to those uh, videos as well, just in case you're interested in remote editing and yeah, NAS systems basically. So let's move on to some other news. And this is for Avid users. Actually, there is a new version of um, Avid Media Composer, which th there's a few, there's a few um, improvements in it. But the main thing here, the main thing um, at the top is the ability to now round trip between Pro Tools. Um, they've integrated the facility to export Media Composer sequences directly into Pro Tools which makes it much, much easier to work with audio post houses, with your sound designer, if they're working remotely, whatever it might be. All you need to do now is you can, in one sing say in one single step, you combine everything into one export, a .ptx file that can be opened directly in Pro Tools. Um, it, it enables teams to complete projects faster and eliminate costly, time-consuming mistakes while accelerating content creation for delivery and post-production workflows. Yeah, I mean, this is great because, you know, m there's a lot, like a majority almost of um, sound designers, sound editors, audio professionals that use Pro Tools and going f from any kind of NLE into an another audio uh, platform and then bringing it back again. It's it's kind of the same with grading as like going from Premiere or Final Cut to DaVinci and then coming back. Round tripping between software is never a fun experience, but if they are now able to export one file and open it up in Pro Tools, I guess it's kind of like an EDL maybe, or a, an XML. Um, you could then save that file. I assume you save that file in Pro, to, Pro Tools and then bring it back into Avid and your, your audio production, your sound design is done. There's other things in this release of Media Composer, improved media management, uh, simplified UI for people that are new to Avid. They're trying to you know, get those people that are leaving uh, Final Cut or Premiere Pro that might be heading towards Resolve, um, but they're trying to grab those and bring them into um, the Avid system. You know, Avid's still the go-to system for films, uh, feature films of any size and a, kind of a lot of TV series as well. Obviously, there's many, many, many more that now use Premiere and still for kind of Final Cut and some are moving into Resolve, but they're trying to grab that that slice of the market. Remote editing and proxy workflow capabilities. Feature films now kind of, they work remotely quite a, a lot of them. Some of the magazines, that you, the editorial magazines that you read, they're working remotely with their, with their cutting floor um, and Media Composer is really, really good at it. Um, I've not tested it myself, but from what I hear, that is the case. So um, it looks like they're continuing to improve on that. Uh, NDI, hey, NDI. If you don't know about NDI, click up there. I've got a guide all about it. Did not know NDI was in Media Composer. Maybe they just added it. But Avid, getting on board with NDI, excellent. Yeah, so some good advancements there in the new Media Composer. Um, if you are an Avid user, let us know in the comments on the review um, how it's working out for you, all these new features, and how it works, that round trip in between Pro Tools. I would be interested to know how exactly it works coming back from Pro Tools or whether they just have to export, uh, whether you even bother to bring it back in as like, um, you know, a .ptx, or you just export from Pro Tools and you bring that file back in. I don't know. Let me know uh, exactly how that works. All right, so lastly, the other news is that Resolve, DaVinci Black, um, Blackmagic Design, DaVinci Resolve, has a patch update for version 18.1. So it's now 18.1.3. There's some subtle improvements, um, but I have seen one video on YouTube about um, keyframing for picture-in-picture -picture kind of source video links. That wasn't working very well before. 
it is now. They fixed that. Um, there's added support for MXF, um, OP1A uncompressed. Let me just have a look here exactly what it is. Uh, support for MXF, OP1A, DNX uncompressed. So more support for DNX um, codex, MXF codex, uh, which is great. Support for the new Sony uh, Venice 2 formats as well. And then it's just, it's really just kind of like general performance and stability improvements. So if you're a Resolve user and, you know, you've had issues with any of these, you might, I don't know, but, or it's not really working the way that you want it to, maybe the stability uh, and performance improvements in this patch might help you out. Worth giving it a go on a project that's not live, um, you know, on maybe a personal project or something. I always recommend not testing new uh, updates on editing platforms on anything that you're working on live for a client. It's just not a good idea in case it goes wrong. But yeah, have a go on something that's not live. And again, let us know how you get on. So that's us caught up again for another episode of DigiPro News. And you know, that as I say at the end of these, there may be something that you've seen or heard or that has come out since I recorded this um, and I might not be able to feature in the next one that you think people need to know about. If so, let people know. Um, I mentioned various different methods you could do that. Um, I want this to be a bit of a community for people to be able to update others. Working smarter, not harder, They're getting all the latest news. People don't have to go out and search for it. You know, if people are watching this on YouTube, they can just look down at a comment and see, oh, there's something excellent from this brand that's just come out. That would be fantastic, um, though I will do my best to bring you the most up-to-date news I can from, you know, around the tech world every single time uh, in each new episode. If you are new here, please do uh, give us a thumbs up, give us a subscribe uh, to the podcast on Apple um, Podcasts or Spotify, leave us a review. Um, let me know what you'd like to improve. Um, you know, it's still in its infancy, so I'm very much open to feedback here. Um, and yeah, work smarter, not harder. It gives you more time to be creative. And I'll see you. Oh, you'll hear me in the next episode. See you then.